All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. And like I said, everybody can hear me okay, correct? I'm Amanda from Roseboro Travel, and on behalf of the whole team at Roseboro Travel, I'd like to thank you for joining us for Let's Talk Travel. It's our once-a-month series, speaker series that we have, in which we bring in vendors who specialize in a particular area of interest. This month, the area of interest is Scotland and Ireland. So obviously you all have either received a phone call or an email inviting you to this event to hear more about Scotland and Ireland. Can I ask, how many people in the room have been to Scotland or Ireland in the past? Okay, a good amount of you. Wonderful. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and get started, but first I'd like to introduce our guests to you. We have Ashley from Brighton Vacations and Monique from Pelting Tours. They are going to be our speakers for this evening, and they will be the ones with all of the wealth of knowledge to answer all of your questions. But first, I started out with a basic question. What do you think of, or what is your favorite thing about Ireland or Scotland? So the first one is Greta. Greta's up first. And Greta, what do you think of when you think of Ireland or Scotland? Okay, well I don't want you all to get the wrong impression, but Dublin, to me, Temple Bar area is the traditional Irish pubs. And you, you walk in and people just come in, sit down, start playing their guitars or the Irish music, folk music, rock, whichever, and then people sing along and dance and the whole atmosphere just takes over. And the other place um, with Dublin is Grafton Street, which is where the shops are, boutique shops, um, all different types. But they also had buskers and street performers, uh, so you have a great atmosphere there as well. But I love Dublin, and you can easily pop over there from London, either for a day trip or for a weekend, and it's definitely worth a visit. Okay, thanks. I don't think anybody's thinking any poorly of you because you like Dublin's bars, right? <laughs> I like the pubs as well, so very good. And Kathy, you have an experience that you like in either Ireland or Scotland too, correct? Oh, I absolutely love both countries. Uh, I like Scotland and I actually had to call, when I was in Scotland, I actually had to call my mother and ask her if we were really Irish because I really, really felt such a, an, uh, a pull to the Highlands. And, and that's truly, I mean, when I think of Scotland, I think of the bagpipes, the Highland dancing, and, you know, the, the rugged, 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 you know, Highlands. They're just gorgeous. You know, it's, you know you've got to be really hardy and, and strong folk to be living there. And so anybody who's got a wee bit of Irish or Scottish in them, you're hardy stock. So it's, it's really amazing. And uh, Ireland, I loved uh, Blarney Castle. I finally, finally climbed Blarney Castle and didn't kiss the stone because I can talk, no problem. Um, but just awesome, fun cities. I really felt like they were home to me. I mean, I do have Irish, you know, ancestry, so that was really, really awesome to really check that out. So everybody's a wee bit Irish. Everybody's a wee bit Irish. Just a wee bit. When we start right. having these presentations or talking about trips to Ireland or Scotland, the whole office gets accents. <laughs> so if you want to wonder, when we answer the phone, it's not just Bretta when it's an Irish day. Uh, we all have accents on those days. So I'm going to go ahead and invite Ashley and Monique on up to the front, and they're going to start answering all of the, the good questions next. So, yeah, the good question. 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 Good and it really is the truth what you said about Temple Bar and other little tiny pubs and restaurants and the towns. You walk in, somebody will just come up to you, have you come sit at their table, you get a mix of the locals, the people that are staying there on their own tourist vacations as well. Um, but definitely 
something that's important when you're considering Ireland or Scotland and also why with a Celtic we do a lot of two night stays if not all through a tour so that you have that free time on your own to really take in the culture whether it be the food which Ash is going to talk about um, as well as the entertainment and just the camaraderie that you find in both of the countries I think that really makes up the most important part of when you visit Ireland and Scotland. So I like to say that Ireland and Scotland are about the people, the place, and the pace. It's, as Monique said, it, it is such a friendly country. Everybody recognizes American travelers specifically. If you think about the history of Ireland and the history of the U.S., it's very similar. So they had a civil war, they had a revolutionary war against the British, so did we. So they very much identify with us as their long-lost cousins across the sea. And they're incredibly friendly. And then when we say it's about the pace, it's about taking your time. It's a destination where there's not really an iconic thing necessarily to go see and do in my mind. Um, it's really about going and getting lost and just seeing the scenery and experiencing the place of being in Ireland and Scotland. And then we also like to say the pace because it is a slow pace kind of going in and out. A slow-paced uh, kind of destination where you just explore on your own. So I, it's hard for me to pick my favorite, but my favorite area is really Killarney in Ireland. Absolutely love it. I could spend a week and a half there and see the same things I've always seen over and over again because there's just so much to see and do in that little area of Ireland. lost in the names, at least for the first time they're looking at them. So I asked them to kind of give us an overview of the destination from beginning in Dublin and going around Ireland. So, Monique, will you take us around Ireland? Let's go around Ireland. <laughs> okay, this is a picture of Dublin. Um, in the evening, as you can see, it's a substantially sized city, and you have the River Liffey. And what we tend to do with a lot of our tours at Celtic is you do round trip from Dublin, or you at least come in or out of Dublin at some point. We can also do the pre and post extensions for you so that you can take that in at your own pace as well. So we will start in Dublin normally um, and continue on. And what we do tend to include in the tours is obviously some of the highlights of Dublin itself. So when you go to Dublin, you have to go to Trinity College, see the Book of Kells. You have the four um, Gospels that are done in um, Latin. They're the illuminated manuscripts, and there's always two that are on display at the um, Trinity College. So if you have a lot of history, if you have the Catholicism, you're going to want to see that. It's something amazing to see. They're definitely the best preserved around, and you're right, this is going in and out. <laughs> also, the Guinness Storehouse. How many of you have seen the Guinness Storehouse? Cool. Whether you drink or not, it is an amazing thing to see. It's funny because when you go, you have it says seven floors. There's actually only six. Don't know why. If anybody knows why, please get back with me at the end of the presentation. At the top of the um, Guinness Storehouse, you have what's called the gravity bar. And it is a 360-degree bar that is all glassed in. And the little tiny picture on the bottom, you can kind of see how it sets out over the city. And I don't know if you guys can see it from here, but each of the panels of glass, as you look out over the city in different regions, it has a description of what you're looking at. Whether it be, you know, St. Patrick's Cathedral, or you're looking out toward O'Connell Street, all of that is listed, and you'll learn how to pour the perfect pint, and you'll be able to sample some pints while you're up there, and you can literally take in the whole city of Dublin on your trip, going around this uh, gravity bar. With us, when we do our trips, we'll normally go into Galway first and then down into Killarney. But Killarney is a phenomenal city. It has so much to offer. Um, everything is very close by, so you'll have a, a good flavor of what there is, and you do get that hospitality of the Irish, which is so common. When we're in Killarney, we're going to continue down to the Ring of Kerry. And it's, called, it's actually called the Ivera Peninsula, but it's better known as the Ring of Kerry. It's 111 miles of a trek. And you'll run around this track, or you'll drive around this track. How's that sound? Um, taking in the beautiful coastal areas, the green pastures. There's various villages along the way that you'll get to see. Another shot um, on a sunny day. We're going to talk about weather in a little while, too. So this is a nice picture to remember, right? 
Um, we'll go through Glen Bay, we'll go through Sneem, so you'll see some of the little Irish towns um, and get that flavor again that we always talk about, the pace and of Irish. From Killarney, we will head down through Cove. Sometimes you'll see it as C-O-B-H, and you want to say Cobb, but it is Cove, and that was the last stop of the Titanic's fateful adventure. So we'll go into Cove, you'll experience that, and then we'll go over into Waterford. Now Waterford, this is a shot of um, right along the waterfront, and you'll see Dooley's Hotel. It happens to be a family-owned property that we use on our tours. On our tours, we're going to make sure you're going to have a few hours when you get in to Waterford that afternoon to take in your own sights and sounds right there on the waterfront. It's about a block off of O'Connell Street, and you're going to find that almost every city in Ireland has an O'Connell Street somewhere, and we'll talk about that too. Um, after we have our dinner at the hotel that evening and you guys rest up, you got to go to the House of Waterford, right? So when you go into the House of Waterford, you're going to have a tour of Waterford. You'll have the factory tour. You'll see how um, the crystal is engraved and cut. You'll see their showroom as well as up in the right-hand corner. You'll see a big case where a lot of the large crystal trophies are held. Now, Waterford has changed hands over time. The main Waterford factory is still here in Waterford, and that is where all the large crystal pieces are created for dignitaries and for different types of sporting events. And then some of the smaller stuff is then sourced out. This is an amazing place to see when you're visiting Waterford, and there's a little bit of shopping to do as well. Now, Sleeves League. This is something that you'll experience when you come down from Donegal. Or if you're doing the reverse itinerary, you go from Dublin, down to Waterford, over to Killarney, up to Galway, and then you'll continue all the way toward the north up to Donegal. And when you're um, up in Donegal, off to the west coast, you'll actually have um, the Sleeves League Cliffs. And everyone talks about the Cliffs of Moher. Who's heard of the Cliffs of Moher? It is the most popular tourist scenic attraction in Ireland. But the Cliffs of Moher go as a maximum of 700 feet above the Atlantic Ocean. Sleeves League is actually almost 2,000 feet above the Atlantic. And what's amazing with Sleeves League is they really still maintained a lot of the natural preserve. So Cliffs of Moher has definitely because they're answering to the tourism, and they put up a lot of different sightseeing posts, a lot more fencing. Sleeves League, when you go up to Sleeves League, there's a visitor center there. And you'll go into the visitor center and there's shopping and there's a little cafe and then they take you up on the mini coaches up to Sleeves League to then take in the views. And there's a couple platforms for you to view, etc. But to me, it's so much more awe-inspiring because you still are very close with nature and when you think that it's twice the height of Cliffs of Moher, it's just breathtaking and spectacular. Now, we'll go down. If we're starting in Donegal and we're coming down toward Galway, you're going to actually go through a town called Balik. And you probably have heard of the Balik porcelain. It's a really fine china, and what it's known for is the thinness of the china itself. But Balik is interesting because it's the northernmost village um, in Ireland, going into the north of um, Ireland itself. And this bridge connects North Ireland to the Republic of Ireland. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences between the North Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But the village of Balik actually crosses into two counties. The one county that's going to set in North Ireland and a little tip of the village that's actually going to still be in the Republic of Ireland. So when we're going through Balik, we'll take you over to the um, Balik factory and you can actually, you know, see how they make their china there. You'll be able to purchase some china to ship home to your family so they don't get angry that they didn't get to go to Ireland with you. And then from down from there, you're going to head down to a place called Sligo. Before you get to Sligo, just north of Sligo is a place called Drumcliff. And Drumcliff is famous because this is the final resting place of William Butler Yeats. I'm sorry, Bates. If you're into the history and the literature and if you have Irish heritage, all of this falls into place as to who you are and your ancestry. And gosh knows with the Irish, you have ancestry that goes way back into everything. And you can find yourself documented in all these towns. I've never seen a country that documents their history as much as Ireland does. The saying that they have here, cast a cold eye on life, on death horse, horseman pass by, that's actually what's engraved on his tombstone. And then I think Ashley, you can... She did bring up um, heritage and history. How many people have Irish blood running through them that they know of? <laughs> Look at all of those hands. Okay, that's a decent amount of people. All 
All right. So, um, Scottish too? I'm here. It's all the same. Scottish? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, Ashley is going to talk to us uh, where Monique left off and tell us the rest of Ireland going up into Northern Ireland. So, Ashley. So Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, just to give you guys an idea, from Dublin to Galway is about three and a half hours. From the south near like where it says Blarney up to the top is about six and a half hours. So it's not a humongously large country. You can do it all within 10 days easy if you're going into Northern Ireland. So what we generally recommend to Brendan is if you're going to stay in the south in the Republic of Ireland where Monique was really talking about seven, eight, nine days, you can really see it in, in an accurate amount of time. If you're going to choose to go up into Northern Ireland, you want to give yourself a couple of extra days. Now, the unique thing about Northern Ireland is that it's not as popular as its southern sister, um, but it has a very good relationship with the Republic of Ireland. What's interesting is that Brendan Vacations, we started doing trips to Ireland in 1969, and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland were at a little bit of a crossroads, as you may remember, a little bit of a history there. And once the troubles had kind of passed, we were really looking at the destination itself, and we wanted to make sure that Americans had the opportunity to really see everything on the island and how it, how it corresponds to each other. So we started taking people to Northern Ireland before there was really even the infrastructure to take tourists there. Um, and it's just grown exponentially since then. So there's a few key things that you're really going to want to check out in Northern Ireland. So taking off from where Monique was talking about here in Balik and kind of going up towards Donegal and Londonderry, one of the major highlights, and I'm not going to go into any order, so I apologize. Um, near Belfast, in Belfast, you actually have the Titanic Museum. So if you're into the history, if you're into Titanic, if you're into um, any of the stories about the Irish immigrants coming over to the US, Titanic's obviously a very big part of that story. And Belfast is really, really proud of the Titanic. Um, all of the ship was made there. They have the old docks there. They built this wonderful, absolutely beautiful welcome center. And it's fantastic inside. It's got all of the history of what went into building the Titanic itself, how the linens were made by the shops there in Belfast, and the china was made by the shops there in Belfast. And as you can see, the Welcome Center resembles a ship. So it's meant to look like a ship. And they've actually recreated the grand staircase from onboard Titanic. So it's a really spectacular experience and probably one of the highlights of visiting Belfast is definitely the history of Titanic itself. The other really key um, area for people to visit up in Northern Ireland is Giant's Causeway. So who knows the story of Giant's Causeway? Who thinks it's man-made? Who thinks it's natural? <laughs> I, I, heard, I have no idea, I like that. So it does look like a man-made road, and hence the name Giant's Causeway. The story is that Finn McCool and all of his giant brothers back in the day created this road, and this is what's left of it. But the reality is that they are basalt columns that are naturally worn away in this hexagonal pattern. So even though it looks like something that man put there, it is completely natural. And as you can see, you can walk out on, on the basalt columns. There's a beautiful welcome center there as well, uh, which has been hugely refurbished over the last, I'd say, 10 years. And so this is a really spectacular experience. The Giant's Causeway is, if there's a middle of nowhere Ireland, Giant's Causeway is there. So if you're up in Belfast and you go up to the very most northern point on the island, that's where you're going to find the Giant's Causeway near a little town called Antrim. So it's kind of out of the way, but it's really spectacular and definitely something you want to make the effort to get out and see. The other thing that's really cool about this area is what we call the Causeway Coastal Road. So in Ireland, uh, say three years ago, they decided to kind of section out the country based on different interests. So if you're interested in ancient history, you have the ancient east you can visit. If you're interested in scenery and being outside, you have the Wild Atlantic Way, which is the coastal area that goes from Cork all the way up to Donegal. At Donegal, then you have a new road that starts, and that is the Causeway Coastal Route. So that would include the Giant's Causeway. It would include a lot of um, beachheads and areas. And what's interesting about these, these coastal routes is that they include a lot of natural scenery. 
They also have some really stunning views that you just can't see anywhere else in the country. So the scenery up in Northern Ireland is completely different than everywhere else in the island, even though it's a very small and compact destination. What you can see here is actually a hanging bridge. It's one of the largest hanging bridges in Ireland and Northern Ireland combined. And so it just kind of goes to show some of the outdoor activities. And there's a lot when it comes to this destination. There's horseback riding. There's surfing if you're interested in trying your hand at hanging 10. There's whale watching. There's cycling. There's, um, you can take guided walks and you can hike. So there's so many outdoor activities to do. If you're somebody who's more adventurous, then this is definitely a fantastic destination. And even though we don't have the slide, the same thing for Scotland. Scotland is very much an outdoor destination as well, and there's a lot of outdoor activities that you can enjoy there that you may not have thought about. One of the other highlights of Northern Ireland and the Northern Republic of Ireland are the murals of Bogside, and this is going to be found in Londonderry. So, as I said, we all remember the history between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And in Londonderry, they actually have these wonderful murals that were painted by local artists that really reflect the history of the Troubles. So we actually do, on our Brendan vacations, with a local specialist, we have them come and join our group. And they're going to take you on a walking tour to see the murals of the Bogside to really give you kind of that history of the Troubles, but also the stories. And I would say Ireland and Scotland are all about stories. In Irish um, culture, we call them the Shauna Keys. So they pass down the oral tradition from generation to generation, and you're, it's really a destination of stories. And so not only just going to see a site and taking a picture and saying, oh, wow, I went here and it was really cool, hearing the stories of the people and how this really affected their lives and what it means to them is really part of the destination. The last thing I really wanted to highlight in this area, who can pronounce this word? Do we have any fluent Irish in the house? <laughs> no? Oh, it's a dying language, unfortunately. So this is the Gael Nacht. The Gael Nacht is, an, is a description that is given to certain pockets throughout Ireland and Northern Ireland where they are preserving the Irish language and culture. So you have three or four major Gelnachts around the coastal areas, one down in the south near Dingle, you have one kind of around the Galway area, and then you have one up in Donegal. So Donegal is kind of the headquarters of the northern Gelnacht, and this is an area where they preserve the ancient language of the Ulster Irish. So what you're going to find in these areas when you see these signs, it means that everything is going to be in Irish first, English second because they're really trying to bring back their culture. When the English were in Ireland, they stamped out everything Irish because they wanted to kind of make them succumb, right, to the English power. And so they couldn't wear their traditional colors, they couldn't speak their language, they couldn't sing their songs. So when the Irish finally gave them the boot, they said, we're bringing this all back. And it took a long time for people to remember the old traditions. So you'll find these gale knocks around um, Ireland, and it's a really fascinating kind of step back in time to see everything in the ancient Gaelic again. Ashley, and the question is about unique accommodations. A lot of times when you're looking to go to Ireland or Scotland, a lot of you will come in and ask us about where can I stay? I want to stay in a castle, or I want to stay in a farmhouse, or I want to stay somewhere really unique. So I asked Ashley to tell us her favorite unique accommodation. So that is one of the coolest things about Ireland and Scotland, is that you can stay in a real castle. Uh, but you can also stay in a farmhouse. You can stay in a manor house. You can stay in a and b There are so many different kinds of accommodations when it comes to Ireland and Scotland. But my favorite, I'm a little bit jaded, is Ashford Castle. <laughs> this is a brand new hotel built last year. No, I'm kidding. This is a castle from the 1200s, 1200s. So it was actually the last ancient king of Ireland. This was his ancestral home. It was kind of a fraction of what it is today. And after the Irish kings were taken over by all of the other generations of people that moved in, it was eventually purchased by the Guinness family, who expanded it to what you see today. So this is a legitimate castle. Now, my grandparents, my family is Irish and Scottish, my grandparents go to Scotland on average every two years. And my grandmother says to me, I want to go to Scotland and stay in a castle. I'm like, yes, we've got lots of castles. Let me show you all these beautiful properties. And she goes, 
no, 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 I want to stay in one that's ruined, that has the stone walls. And I'm like, this is 2015. They realized about 500 years ago that castles with stone walls are cold and damp and really uncomfortable. So what they've done is they've kept the beauty and the history of these properties, but the inside is the most luxurious five-star hotel you've ever seen in your whole life. So Asher Castle is um, part of our family of brands. It's managed by our sister company, the Red Carnation Hotels. And these are all boutique luxury hotels until we purchased Asher Castle, because it's not so boutique, right? It's a, it's a pretty big property. What makes this castle really spectacular, though, outside of the fact that it's from the 1200s, is that there's so many cool things you get to do here. So whenever we have this included on our guided trips, or if you stay there um, independently on some of our independent travel options, we always recommend two days, or at least get there as early as you possibly can on the first day. Because the castles in Ireland and Scotland have a lot of amenities. So specifically with Ashford, you are on a lake, which you can't really see here. It's called Lake Corrib. And you can do sailing on the lake. There's boat trips. There's also bicycles you can rent and ride, ride into the village of Kong. But there are one of only a handful of places where you can fly birds of prey. So you can do the falconry flying. And you can get out there with the big leather glove on and you let them fly and they land on your arm and it's weird and awesome all at the same time. There's also a nine-hole golf course at Ashford Castle. So if you want to go to golf in Ireland, it can sometimes be difficult to get tee times. If you stay at the castle, you can actually play golf for free as a, as a, what am I looking for? Amenities. Thank you, as an amenity. <laughs> Ashford just overwhelms me. So Ashford Castle is my favorite property. Very cool. All right, so timing around the best time of year, correct? You don't want to go when it's rainy season or a rainforest. You want to go, well, hey, I'm, I'm not talking about Ireland necessarily. Um, you want to plan to go around the best time of year, right? That's always what people come in and ask. So, Monique, will you tell us where the best time of year is? And I'm not talking about a rainforest, I'm talking about Ireland. That's a really difficult question to answer. Um, I figured the best way to show this to you is by a chart. You know, there are destinations that, you know, you have in-season, you have off-season. You have the rainy season, you have the non-rainy season. If you've noticed, Ireland has got a lot of green. It's got the 40 shades of green, not the 50 shades of gray. Now, when you look at the chart, you're going to see you're going to have rain throughout the season. It's never necessarily a heavy rain. It kind of comes and goes, and the sun comes out, and then you've got just misty days. However, it doesn't sometimes correspond to the most popular times to go. When you look at this, you're going to have June, and you're going to have um, as actually your driest month, and it is a popular time to go, also because it's not crowded yet for the summer. Summertime, July and August, tend to often be a very busy time because the weather temperatures go up, which I'm going to show you in a second. Our popular times are May, June, September, and October. Now, does that make sense when you initially look at the chart? It doesn't. Those are the times, if you ask an Irishman, they're going to tell you September is the most spectacular time to go. It is a little bit drier. You're always going to have rain. It's called layering, rain slickers. You can pack an umbrella, but then you look at Mary Poppins if it gets a little windy out. So when people talk about, oh, the best time to go, it really comes down to your budget. It comes down to what you want to see and what is most important to you. Some people don't want the real cold temperatures. When you get into November to the beginning of February, it's quite chilly, as you can see from the temperatures. But even in July and August, you're not going to get much past the mid-60s. Now, if the sun is shining that afternoon, you may get up to 70, 72 degrees. And if the wind is blowing, it may not necessarily feel like 66 or 65. But you can see everything is pretty moderate. You don't rarely, you rarely get snow, and it never really sits on the ground. So it's never going to be Caribbean hot. How many of you guys have done a Caribbean cruise? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Exactly. We're in Florida. Oh, yeah. So never expect Caribbean hot, guys. It's never going to be that way. But I would say that if you're looking for a very budget-conscious time where you want the best value for your money, May, June, September, and into October, July and August are going to be the warmest times to go. 
June being the least rainy, if that matters to you, you can get amazing deals, especially on self-drives. Um, at Celtic, we don't just do the escorted tours, but we will do the self-drives. We'll do chauffeur drives, and we will do, do those year-round. You'll find that once you get into November to January, February, it's sometimes hard to get a good selection of escorted tours. A lot of the tour operators um, will only offer maybe one year round because, again, it can be quite chilly at that time of season to go. But the upside is that is you don't have the lines, you don't have the crowds, and you can then therefore browse and, and take in the, scene, the sights and scenery on your own and not have to um, rush or feel rushed in the different destinations. Well, I actually talked a little bit about North Ireland, so I'm happy that we kind of, you know, in our minds, coordinated this, these PowerPoints just perfectly. Um, if you have a lot of history buffs out there, what was exciting in 2016, it was the 100th anniversary of the uprising against British rule um, for Ireland. So what Ireland did as a country is they um, created a lot of visitor exhibits, updated exhibits that really highlighted the um, anniversary of the uprising against um, the Brits. So you don't really have to go much further than Dublin to really take in a lot of historical areas um, if you are that history buff looking back on your heritage and history. This here is the um, General Post Office and is located on Connell Street and a lot of the fighting and the uprising actually happened right here. Um, they created a new visitor exhibit specifically for the 100th anniversary, so it can walk you through the whole history of what occurred, the different people that were instrumental in having this um, happen and have the overthrow of the British rule itself. O'Connell Street, remember I mentioned you're finding O'Connell everywhere? This is Daniel O'Connell's statue. Um, Daniel O'Connell, he was very instrumental in um, working through and getting the Catholic Emancipation Act passed, which basically led the Catholics to have a limited number of Catholics that were now able to vote. Um, O'Connell was also the first mayor of Dublin who was a Catholic. So there's a lot of history there. I love this street because you have a lot of sightseeing throughout it. You have the little shops, you have some pubs, you have restaurants, but every so many blocks you're going to have a different statue. Um, whether it's Sir John Gray, um, you'll have the spiral of Dublin, which is this gigantic spiral that reaches into the sky. So you can literally get out, walk about, see the culture and the people and the, what we've talked about throughout the presentation, but you'll have all of these different statues throughout O'Connell Street with the placards on them explaining to you the history of what has occurred and how Ireland has come to be what it is today. The other thing that is extremely popular, and this is something that you definitely want to book ahead of time before you go, whether you're doing a self-drive or you're going to be extending your stay on an escorted tour, this is the Kilmanham Jail, and this is where a lot of the um, uprisers, the protesters um, that were involved in the uprising against Britain were actually jailed and where they were executed. So as you can see here, and I found this picture, I was so excited because you could see all the different types of... Um, where did it go? Oh, there we go. You can see all the different exhibits on the ground floor that will walk you through the history, tell you the different um, people that had actually stayed at the jail and what happened to them and how they were instrumental to the uprising itself. <clears throat> this here is going to be the Dublin Castle, and this is where the headquarters of the British Parliament were during the time. All of this is within the city of Dublin. So again, when you're talking about historic places, you don't have to travel very far, even though Ireland isn't huge, you don't have to travel very far to take in history. So I would say that if you're going in the next year or so, that this is the place to go for the historical aspect, and you can take in a lot of different sites throughout Dublin. Very nice. Okay, so then currency is the next question. What kind of currency do we use? Can we use our credit cards? Or what, how do we shop? Shopping is so important. Eating and shopping, right? Well, as you've already realized that Ireland is made up of basically two separate countries. You have North Ireland, which is a part of the UK. So they are on the British pound. They use sterling. And the Republic of Ireland is on the euro. It's a part of the European Union. When you go over to Ireland, they're not really going to take your U.S. dollar. So you do definitely need to get your exchange. And I would suggest going ahead and doing your euros, depending upon where you're going to spend most of your time. Um, I think Ashley mentioned, and, and I think that um, Amanda also said, you know, 
the Republic of Ireland, the south of Ireland, is always seems to be the first place that people visit when they go to Ireland. That is the most popular, and sometimes North Ireland has been overlooked. But with Brexit happening, with the British exiting the, um, you, you know, the Union, it's interesting because now there's this renewed interest in North Ireland and her PIN number like you would for a debit card here in the States. Ours are chipped with signatures. Don't fear. If you want to be on the safe side, check with your institution. You know, if you're taking money out of an ATM, you already know what your PIN number is. But most of the shops over in Ireland, whether it be in the North or in the Republic, they will go ahead and process out a receipt that you would be able to sign for that. Um, obviously, you can get some euros and use cash as well. That is the biggest thing to know. So there is no fear. Just take some euros with you. Take an American Express if that's what you prefer to use, but have a MasterCard or Visa as backup. And just be aware of the currency difference between the two countries. Scotland is going to be in the British pound as well, and it's no different than what North Ireland is doing. So anything that I just said for North Ireland is going to go into place with Scotland. If you're now, however, if you're going to be in Scotland for days on end, go ahead and get the pound because it's going to be a pain giving the euros, getting the pounds back and back and forth. So you'll definitely want to get some currency exchange there. But if you're just focusing mostly on Ireland, doing a little taste up to the north, you'll be fine keeping your euro with you. So we find that Ireland sees a surge in August because of Scotland. So if you're going to do the two together and you're kind of open to when you want to travel, Scot or August is a great month because you have the military tattoo. So a lot of people don't realize exactly what this is. That giant building there in the back is Edinburgh Castle. And you can go through that and there's a lot of great history. It's a wonderful part of the city. And right behind it, they built this massive stadium where they hold the military tattoo. And what it is, is all of the bands and the pipers that they would have used in the military formations hundreds of years ago when they went to battle have now been kind of turned into an art form. And they do parades. They walk through the center of the stadium and they do their military formations and they do their drum um, solos, if you will. And they have dancing and they have singing and they have all of this really cool stuff going on. And it's every single day in August. So if you're going to Scotland, this is definitely a highlight to check out. And it's always included on our guided vacations. You can also book it as an independent um, excursion on your, your self-driver, your chauffeur vacations as well. Very nice. So we decided.